Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you not joining us here on the West Coast. My name is Basil Sadek. I'm the Marketing Associate here at Volunteer Match, and I'd like to welcome you to Volunteer Match's Nonprofit Insights Series, Understanding the 2017 Volunteer Management Progress Report. We've got a great topic and brilliant speakers today, but before I turn this over to Toby and Trina, I did want to go over a few housekeeping notes. First of all, all of you are on an automatic mute this morning, so you don't need to worry about any background noise on your part. Just because we can't hear your voice doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. You should see a GoToWebinar toolbar in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Once you open that up, you'll see the word questions with either a plus sign or an arrow sign next to it, and that's your questions tool. Please feel free to type in your questions as we go through today's webinar, and we'll start answering them towards the end. I'm also going to be live tweeting today, so if you're on Twitter and would like to ask a question there or join in the conversation, you can do so by using the hashtag DMLearn, like volunteer match learn. And last but not least, we'll share a link to the full report with all of you approximately one, after, one hour after the webinar ends. All right, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Toby Johnson, president of Toby Johnson & Associates as well as Volunteer Pro, and Trina Willard, Principal of the Knowledge Advisory Group. Um, also, Pam will not be joining us today, but she is one of the researchers of this report. Welcome, Toby and Trina. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Toby Johnson. Trina's joined me. Trina Willard's joined me. We're really excited to share some of our insights from the Volunteer Management Progress Report today. Uh, we learned a ton through this research and we're going to walk you through it and then at the end we'll tell you uh, how you can uh, and Fossil will be selling, sending an email with a link to be able to download the entire report. The report itself is 46 pages so we won't be able to do it justice completely today but we're going to do our best. So here's what we're going to talk about the overview and methodology of the research, what we found the key data and findings were. Now, we won't cover all the findings, but you can get all of them from the report itself. We also want to, would love to hear your ideas for the 2018 survey. We will be doing this survey every year, so it's a, a wonderful to hear what people would like us to ask. Every year, we will switch out a few different questions. Um, so we like to get at what the field really wants to know about. Uh, and then your questions and comments. So as we go, if you have questions, just go ahead and pop them in the questions box. And sooner or later, we'll get to them, maybe as we go along or at the end. So if, as you think of them, go ahead and pop them in the box. And don't worry about typos. It's okay. I can read. So also uh, with, would, not be, uh, would be remiss if I didn't thank, uh, with deep gratitude, our distribution partners, um, uh, of which Volunteer Match is one of the organizations that helped us distribute the survey link out to everybody. Uh, and we had Jason Frenzel and Alana Napa, who are both, uh, Jason's a CVA and Alana is an MSW, and they both are very uh, well uh, learned and veteran volunteer managers in the field. And so we had them also review the, uh, the survey itself, the survey instrument, the questionnaire, uh, just to make sure it made sense. Uh, so we got a lot of good feedback just to to create something that people could uh, use fairly simply and that could get us the information we needed. So thank you all distribution partners and Basel, thanks a lot to Volunteer Match for having us today and also for helping us get the, the uh, link out uh, earlier this year, last fall. So why did we wanna do a survey like this in the first place? I decided a couple of years ago that I really, uh, as a, a service provider of training and consulting for volunteer organizations, I found it really hard to find information about where we were at as a field, to understand what the key challenges were, to understand what people were struggling with, to understand where we, we were at, uh, just in terms of how we felt about our satisfaction in the field. And so I decided that I would create this survey and also continue it over time. And so I didn't just plan to do one survey once and be done. I wanted to do it year after year so we could start to track trends because we really wanna see if our field 
can grow in certain ways. And you'll see some of the ways as we talk today about areas that we may wanna think about growing. We all need to become better advocates for the, this field that we all love. So volunteer resource managers really can benefit from seeing how their colleagues rate their own uh, work life. Uh, so they can better advocate within their organizations and outside them. Volunteer-led organizations, I think the leaders at your organizations need to have clear benchmarks and sometimes having this type of information can help you do some benchmarking uh, to make informed decisions. Nonprofit consultants, trainers, and capacity builders like Trina and myself really need to know what our greatest needs are for our field. And, and there's been some eye openers. Certainly we keep pretty on top of what people need and we have both worked in the field for a long time in nonprofits. Uh, so, uh, but you know, there's always something new we learn from the survey. And then, like I said, we're gonna do this every year so we can track improvements and emerging issues because you know, the world is changing so rapidly lately. Even in the last five years, there's just been radical change in how we do business in nonprofit with the advent of technology, social media, smartphones, mobile technology, you name it, it's pretty much changed a lot of our volunteer expectations, our organization's expectations, et cetera. Uh, so we wanna be able to track this over time. So those are some reasons. Our methodology, just wanna give you a kind of a quick overview. We had 13, a little over 1300 volunteer administrators, uh, both paid and volunteer. They were self-selected and they started the survey. Some were disqualified if they didn't work directly with volunteers. So we had about a little over a thousand complete most of the questions, if not all of the questions in the survey. That's a really good, uh, uh, confidence level, when we looked at, uh, we figured out our confidence level, the level of reliability of the survey, we figured on the 1.5 million nonprofits in the US. Uh, we had, so that's how we figured out that 95 plus or minus 3.75 um, confidence level. And that is actually really good confidence, confidence for, so we're fairly, as a whole, confident in the reliability of our results. So uh, if we were to take a different set of th a thousand volunteer managers, we would be, get very close to the same results. So that's good to know. So we can make generalizations about this, the information that we brought, uh, that we uh, have in our report. We had about 34, we had 34 to 38 questions with closed and open-ended end, questions. So most of them were closed-ended because open-ended questions are very hard to, uh, when you have a lot of respondents that are hard to handle. So we had to do a lot of closed-ended, you know, check at the box. However, uh, and it's 34 to 38, depending on which country you're from. We had people from 19 different countries complete the survey. And depending on your country, we also then would branch the survey so they would ask what state are you from or what um, um, territory are you from, that kind of thing. And then we had the survey up for about a month in the fall and then look for it this fall. We'll have another, uh, it, it open again this fall for next year's survey. And again, we had inputs from colleagues. Uh, our researcher uh, is Pam Capolides. She's at La Trobe University in Australia. You're probably wondering if you're from the US, why Australia? Well, each year we're trying to expand our reach into new countries and this year it was Australia. And then Trina's our evaluation and statistician expert. And then we did it via SurveyMonkey. So that's kind of just in a nutshell how the me methodology worked. We had 18 countries, 18 slash 19. Somebody said EU, uh, and I'm like, well, what's the EU? What country are we gonna call that? So mostly <laughs> from the US, but uh, we got a lot of folks from Australia and Canada and then some smaller countries. Most of the people that filled out the survey uh, serve their local city, county, or region. So most of them are not national, or they may be in a national organization, but their office serves a local, more local, uh, localized uh, um, space. And then the types of organizations, we had a fairly uh, uh, good uh, uh, differentiation of types of organizations, but nonprofits, of course, were the largest. Uh, and we did split out hospital, clinic, hospice, because they're sort of neo nonprofit. Sometimes, sometimes they're for profit, nonprofit. Uh, and then government, uh, federal government um, was, or I'm sorry, yeah, local government was the highest number of governments, but 
we had a little bit of other government, federal government, state government kind of thing. So mostly nonprofits though, mostly private charities. And then the top causes were uh, not surprising, um, healthcare and medical, because those are the large number of nonprofits are in that category, child welfare, family services, social services, senior and disability, arts and culture, and ed education and libraries. We also had a lot of other, and if you look in the report, we have a huge list of all of the different causes we surveyed, but our, our respondent types, but they, um, these are the top ones. So nearly half of the people who responded to the survey were uh, large organizations, so 101 or more paid staff, and over half, 56%, had budgets of a million dollars or more. So these are, so the most of the survey respondents, I would not say that this is a group of very small nonprofit organizations. I would say this is medium to larger, or medium to large nonprofits. So, um, okay. Demographics. This was one of the first areas where we saw a need for possible advocacy. Our uh, demographics around, well, not actually, yeah. So the demographics in terms of um, race and ethnicity, the majority of people were white, and in fact, more uh, homogenous than um, those in the nonprofit uh, world. So in the nonprofit world in general, we have about 18% people of color, but in our uh, survey, we only had 11% in terms, and remember, this is a very pretty good statistically relevant sample size. So I think we may have work to do. It's something to investigate further. When Basel and I did our podcast uh, a few weeks ago on this on the report, uh, we talked about this need for possible diversification. So it's a question. Research always brings asks you to ask more questions. You know, it always prompts you to ask more questions, and that's good research. Good research prompts you to ask more questions. So, one of my questions is: Is this really how our field looks? And if so, how does it affect how we engage volunteers in our communities? Is it an issue or not? You know, I personally would like to see more diversity in our um, field in our professionals. So. We also know we are a very highly educated uh, workforce. Uh, many of us have a master's, you know, higher, higher education degree, uh, bachelor's degree, half of us do, and then uh, some of us have master's and doctoral degrees. Most uh, of the folks who responded are paid full time, uh, and many are department of one, and you may be one of those people that's a department of one. You handle it all. So, and most don't have a professional certification like a CVA or a CAVS. So that's kind of in a nutshell, the big sort of look at the demographics. Job title, and by the way, today we'll use lots of different titles interchangeably, uh, only because we have not settled in our field on a specific standardization of our job titles. So they're all over the map, but the most commonly used uh, is coordinator. Folks have the word coordinator in their job title. Uh, and here's a breakdown you can see on percentage of time spent on volunteer management. Only a third of the respondents get to spend 100% of their time working with volunteers. Uh, so we it's not surprising, you probably know this already because you may be one of those people who wears many hats, but this field wears many hats. So that's an area to think about. Is, is our effectiveness uh, impacted when we have to spread our time across so many different uh, areas of responsibility? So just something interesting to see there. Uh, and then in terms of professional experience, we had a really wide range, which makes me really happy because then we get a very wide range of perspectives. But it, this is the same as last year. And in fact, this year we even added more uh, categories for uh, years working in the field. And again, we have, you know, last year I think we had 20% with over 20 years. This year we have 18% with over 20 years working in the field. So that's pretty, uh, interesting that we have that many folks but it also points out to me that perhaps we need to think about succession planning if we're going to lose one out of five volunteer uh leaders of volunteers in our organizations within the next five or ten years then perhaps we need to plan for that succession and loss of institutional knowledge because it takes a while to learn how to do this job well 
um, and to build that wisdom. So it, but the good news is we have a good wide range of, we weren't able to, the data we collected, we weren't able to figure out churn, you know, how often are people, you know, all the people who took the survey are currently actively working in the field. So we didn't talk to anybody who isn't currently working. So we can't tell from the questions we asked, you know, how often are people leaving jobs? We do have some satisfaction stuff we'll share later, but uh, um, we don't have that specific data. So we're now to Trina's section on how do they describe their work. So take it away, Trina. Okay, great, thanks. Um, thank you all for being here today. It's great to share some of this information with you. Um, as Toby said, I'm going to dive into how the volunteer managers that we uh, surveyed would describe their work. And I'd like to start by taking a look at the annual budget. So the annual volunteer program budget. And what we found here was interesting that about one third of those who responded had an annual, annual program budget of less than $5,000 set aside. Um, which was very, very small, probably not a surprise to many of you, but a very small budget. And in fact, there were 6% that had no budget whatsoever set aside for the volunteer program. Um, another interesting finding that was similar to something we found last year was that a little over a quarter of those who responded um, actually did not know their program budget. Um, at all. So they had no knowledge of, whether, of their program budget. So that was interesting, we thought. Now, as we turn to uh, volunteer roles, we had asked a question um, this year about the types of volunteers used by the responding organizations. And you see that information on the left side of this slide. Um, these, these definitions for these categories are not crystal clear, we tried to give some information to provide uh, some guidance as to what each one of these categories meant. But you can see that the breakdown here was that 62% of the respondents indicated that they use volunteers in a regular capacity, regular volunteers, as opposed to other types of categories like episodic volunteers for special events and so forth, or volunteers that served on their board, for example. So um, there were a number of different categories there that you can see, but those were the three most common ways that volunteers were used. And then on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the types of capacities that volunteers were used for. So what sort of tasks were they utilized for? And this was something that we had asked in last year's survey as well. And you can see that it's very clear that special events was the top area, the, the most uh, frequent type of task that volunteers were utilized for. And there, there were over three quarters of the respondents indicated that they use volunteers for special events. And then there are the items that are listed in bold on that table on the right are all other types of tasks that over 50% of the respondents indicated. Um, that they utilized volunteers for. So that includes things like um, office and administra administrative types of roles, data entry, um, outreach, etc. Okay, so if we look at the next slide, um, we actually from last year, we learned some lessons about uh, other ways to categorize the way volunteer management is occurring. And we developed these three categories of where volunteers are placed. And we use that in some of the questions on the survey this year. So those three categories are, um, I'm placing volunteers within my own program versus I'm placing volunteers within my organization but in another department versus I am placing volunteers in another organization altogether. So you see here on this slide that most of the people who responded to this survey were placing volunteers in another department within their own organization. So over half of the sample indicated that that is their primary placement role. 
And let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So we're going to take each one of those categories and dissect it a little bit. So if we turn to the next slide, we see that um, we see the number of volunteers that participated annually for those people who place volunteers within their own program. And you see that average number of volunteers placed was 101 to 250 on the right. So that was the, the average number that we see. About 20% of the sample indicated that they had placed more than 500 volunteers a year. So that was a pretty interesting finding, we thought. So we looked at that a little bit deeper in terms of not only for those who are placing volunteers within their own program, but the number of volunteers that they directly supervised when they were in that role. And nearly half of the respondents who placed volunteers in their own program uh, reported being responsible for supervising, directly supervising um, less than 50 volunteers. So that was the, the primary finding there. Um, the, there were about 14% or so that said they directly supervised more than 250 volunteers, which is a pretty big load for most, uh, most managers, as you can imagine. And then as we take a look at that second category of placement, so volunteers that are placed within your organization, but in another department. Our next slide shows us a bit of data around that. Uh, about 40% of the respondents indicated that they placed between 51 to 250 volunteers in other departments within their own organizations each year. Um, the average was a bit, was in the 101 to 250 range, so on the higher end of that. And over a third of them had actually placed over 250 volunteers in another department annually. And so as we turn to that third category, the number of volunteers that are placed with another organization entirely, um, we see that nearly a quarter of the respondents reported placing over a thousand volunteers each year with other organizations. And that average number of volunteers placed is a bit higher than the other categories we just looked at. So the average is around 251 to 500. So if you look at all of that data together, kind of pull it together and look at the patterns there, you see that managers tend to have to directly oversee or place more volunteers as their responsibilities have a bit more different distance from those tasks. So, um, Toby, did you have any thoughts on that as you looked at that information? Uh, in terms of number of placed or number supervised? Number placed? Number uh, placed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with so, these, it's not surprising with the, because some of these organizations that were completing, that were categorizing themselves and we asked what is the primary where do you place the highest number of volunteers we know many right. departments will will place in in different well will have their own volunteers they'll also place with other departments uh, so so we asked where what's the number so what's your primary focus of your department or your your um program and it's not surprising with this one that um there are larger numbers because these are usually volunteer centers or intermediaries. And, you know, some of these are very large organizations, obviously, of 23% um, right. placing, you know, tens of thousands or thousands. So um, it's not surprising to see that. I, it, we were trying to get at the, some of this, these questions, we were really trying to get at uh, sort of what have, are the levels of responsibility? Can, what can people handle? What's reasonable in terms of volume for volunteer managers to handle in terms of placing and supervising. And so at the first step towards figuring that out is really to just to figure out what uh, is really happening. So unfortunately, you know, we have to give these kind of wide bands. So, you know, average number of volunteers placed. Right. We, we can't average it down to one number because we only ask people to check off bars. So the 251 to 500. But I think if you're, 
in an organization and um, you, you know, you want to advocate for either less or more, more resources to place more volunteers or have, have less expectation of less volume because you just can't handle it. It's too much workload. You know, maybe these charts can help you out with that. But, the, you know, the ratio uh, was really what we're trying to get at, but we didn't really completely get at, at it this year. The other thing um, I would say is this survey is a survey of what is. It's not a survey of what is effective. So, you know, we're trying to right. paint a picture of the field as a whole, what's happening. Uh, but the, it do trying to figure out effectiveness using a survey, uh, self-reported survey, isn't the best way to go about figuring out effectiveness. So there are limitations to what we're presenting. Just want to put that out there. Right. This is this is really describing the current state, if you will, right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. uh, based upon the folks who responded to the survey. So what we're seeing here is that if you are placing volunteers outside your organization, you're you're more than likely dealing with a higher volume of yes. volunteers, yes. and that in and of itself may be valuable information. Now, yeah. perhaps even more important then is taking a look at salary. Yes, uh, which is something that everyone's always interested in, and we made some changes in the salary questions from the survey last year. If any of you had participated in that, we had asked in the past um, to, for individuals to designate the salary band that they were in before. And that's usually beneficial because sometimes individuals are a little bit uh, reluctant to provide their actual salary because it's a piece of personal information. But those bands were a little bit unwieldy to deal with in some ways. So we experimented this year with asking people to give us their actual salary figure. And we had a very good response rate to that. I think we'll probably continue to do that in the future because it is easier to analyze and more precise, of course. So you can see from uh, the first slide here about salary that the average salary in the United States was about $45,000, a little bit more than $45,000. And you also see that the numbers very similar um, in equivalent U.S. dollars for Australia. Now, those two countries are really the only two countries where we had a sample size large enough to have um, a finding that's representative, but we did provide the information that we received from a few other countries there just for comparison purposes. But you can see that average of 45,000 or so. And then we started parsing that apart a bit on the next slide, and we look at the breakdown, the salary breakdown by the type of organization, which is something that Toby had mentioned earlier. So we see that for nonprofits, the average is around $41,000 annual salary, and that's on the lower end. And on the higher end, we see that federal government workers are reporting an average salary of around $62,000, dollars So that, we, we did get some questions from a few folks about whether the federal government workers were really skewing that average, um, but they, there were very few of them, so they didn't have a tremendous impact on that average. Um, I wanted to point your attention to these bullets that are on the left side of this slide. Um, and we looked at the relationship between salary and some other factors. So what we found in essence was that the higher your salary was, um, and that was related to, positively related to your number of years in the field, the number of active volunteers that you manage, the number of volunteers that you place, um, higher program budgets, and higher levels of satisfaction, which probably is is not a big surprise there. Um, the survey that we did in 2016, we were, did not see those kinds of correlations, but as I mentioned earlier, um, we used a, a little bit of a different salary um, structure in terms of capturing that data. So that's, um, that's a change that we made this year. So if we move forward and look at uh, salary a bit more, we, we uh, 
reviewed salary with regards to job title. And then we also reviewed salary broken down by the type of certifications for individuals who actually indicated they had one or more types of certifications. And what we see here is that there's a, a correlation between average salary and job title with um, people who have a title of director as earning the most on average at a, almost $58,000 a year. And those with a job title of assistant are on the lower end, so around $28,000 per year. Now, Toby had mentioned earlier that, that these job titles are not really universally understood. So when you have a larger organization, you tend to have more layers of job titles as opposed to a small organization. So a director in a, in a very small shop might be uh, equivalent to a very high level um, job title in a large organization. So we have to kind of take that with a grain of salt to understand that the, there are not really universal definitions of these job titles across the sector. And then we also took a look at the annual salary with certification types. Um, you can see in the, the chart on the bottom of this slide that there were some relationships that popped out there. Um, salaries may be more related to uh, the type of organization though, as opposed to the certification. So for example, we do see that um, for, for those who have a CAE certification, that salary is obviously considerably higher at 91,000, but those are association executives. So that makes some sense that that would pop out as a higher number because they have um, a different level of job responsibility within organizations. Okay, all right, so um, there's one more section that I wanna share with you that is asking the volunteer managers in the sample about their needs looking forward in the future. So the first thing we asked about here is whether they thought the need for volunteers would change in the next 12 months. And we did find that seven out of 10 who responded to the survey, around 70% indicated that they thought the need for volunteers would increase in the next 12 months or so. Um, most of the rest of the sample thought that the need would stay about the same, stay pretty steady. And there were very, very few who indicated a decreased need for volunteers in general. Now, as we look at uh, the next slide, uh, one of the things that we asked in the survey was for respondents to share with us their number one biggest challenge in their own words. Um, and this is one of those types of questions that Toby was mentioning earlier that is an open-ended question. So it was a narrative response. They were allowed to describe as much information as they wanted. And uh, that is one of the types of questions that takes quite a bit of massaging to, um, to actually analyze. So we took all of that narrative information and we coded all of those responses into categories. And that is what you see reflected in the table on this slide. So we actually looked at overall what the statistics look like first. So we found that recruitment was one of the, the top needs for everyone in general. Um, respect and reliability was also very high on the list. And then we took a look at these three types of placement scenarios that we talked about before. So the breakdown is shown here. Um, for those who are placing volunteers within their own department, for those who are placing volunteers within other departments in their organization, and for those who are placing volunteers in other organizations. And what you see here is our very similar results, regardless of the placement destination, um, the same issues are identified as biggest challenges there. So recruitment was the top challenge across all three of those categories, and respect and reliability was the 
the second one there. And the respect and reliability piece really refers quite a bit to um, how the volunteer managers felt that their role was respected within the organizations that they worked. So you're slightly more likely to note respect as an issue if you're placing volunteers outside your own department in some instances there. And then one more thing that I wanted to touch on here was this idea of agency support. So we, we asked the respondents to give a grade to their, about their leadership on the level of support that leadership provided to the volunteer program. And we asked them to do that on a sort of a traditional alphabetic grading scale, A, B, C, D, F. Um, over half of the respondents gave their leadership a grade of A, which was exceptionally good, or B, which was very good, um, for their support of volunteer initiatives and programming. But there was a small number, about 12% or so, that rated them on that lower end, the D, F end of the scale, which is, of course, not where any of us like to be. Um, there wasn't really any apparent relationship between the number of years in the field and the perceived management support of the program. Um, but we did find that that was an issue that we asked a specific question about this year because it came out very strongly in our narrative results uh, during the last survey in 2015. So with that, I will throw it back to Toby to start with the satisfaction information. Awesome. Thanks, Trina. Okay, so let's look at ARC volunteer coordinator satisfied. I know you have a lot of challenges, uh, those of you who are working with volunteers, uh, because you know we hear about them a lot because we're in the business of helping people solve problems. So we, our ear is always to the ground uh, around what are the biggest challenges. And this year, of course, we heard again, and you know we hear this a lot: recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. Um, but Aside, and then we hear that that second layer, Trina just covered with respect and reliability. And the reliability piece of that was really more about our volunteers uh, respecting the organization, and the program by showing up. So there's sort of the respect on the uh, coworkers and leadership and that kind of thing. There's also the reliability of the volunteers. So those things together made up that respect and reliability. Um, uh, category when we were coding the the open-ended comments uh, and they were delightful to read by the way just really fun to read and the the <laughs> report actually has a lot of a uh, lot of the most some of the most interesting comments we included in the report in, in little thought bubbles so you can read some of them uh, but we also wanted to know you know are people satisfied this is a tough job uh, it is it is like I like to say it is rocket science people are juggling a lot of different skill sets and responsibilities. It's a people business. It's a uh, results business. Um, you're, uh, you have to lean more on your leadership skills and your supervisory skills. You, you don't have a lot of leverage all the time um, when you're uh, leading volunteers. So uh, satisfaction, you know, there's possibility that it wouldn't be that great, you know, based on, you know, what we're hearing from people around their challenges. But in the end, it turned out that set people were highly satisfied with the field. Now, I will say one thing about this result. It is uh, skewed probably a little bit because we're not asking the people who've quit the field and left the field or are not currently working in volunteer management. Um, so the people right. who fill this out are the people that are still in the field, right, right, Trina? Right, so. and that's really important to understand in the context here that it that that finding would likely be much less positive if we in, were able to include people who had left the field. Um, <laughs> so this may be a little bit skewed. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, this result does not include the gone and grumpy. <laughs> oh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I just made that up. Anyway, you know, you got to have fun with data. 
so but so no it's probably skewed a little bit but still it's nice to see that um but so we also uh asked some other questions that are we thought were might be related to satisfaction so this is a new question we switched out we switched out a question about recruitment um and we switched out a question about um volunteer screening uh practices uh, so, and we added in a few of these new questions about, so we always switch out the practice questions a little bit. So this year we wanted to find out, was volunteer involvement included in the agency's written strategic plan? And we were pleased to see that 60%, uh, uh, over half, it is. So you would think volunteer involvement would always be included in a written strategic plan, but, you know, but maybe no. not. <laughs> but it's not, uh, not yet Should anyway. Be. This is yeah. one of those things I like to track over time a little bit. But, uh, but the, the other disturbing part of it, though, is that 20% don't know. So there is people don't have their hands on the organization's strategic plan. And if you're working with volunteers, uh, seems like it's such a strategic human resources uh, initiative. I mean, it's your, it's your part of your human resources strategy that it would probably be need to be part of your strategic plan. So that was an interesting result. Uh, we also wanted to find out, you know, is, you know, we're still trying to get that, that, that idea of churn. I mean, are people coming and going, coming and going, or are people staying? So we asked uh, people, uh, respondents, how do you plan to be working in the field three years from now? And uh, the majority, 71%, either strongly agree or somewhat agree. Now, I also saw some responses in the open-ended comments where people said, you know, we had an open-ended comment at the very end where people could add whatever they wanted um, to share with us. And some people said, hey, the only reason I'm planning to leave is because I'm retiring. I would not be leaving if I wasn't retiring. So, so there, this is probably a little bit larger of a number, but that's that's pretty good. You know, we've got about 11% uh, um, planning to leave in the next three years. So um, that, I think that that bodes well for us in our, our collective wisdom and moving together uh, forward as a field. And so that that's pretty much all the data we have to share today. Now the report again has lots more. It also has um, uh, information on um, you know, you can read some of people's, some of the respondents open into comments, but we thought we'd break for a minute and just ask you for next year, for your own personal informational and advocacy purposes, whether within your organization or outside of it in the field, what are questions you think uh, you might want us to include next year? What are things that you might want to know? And we're always asking these questions and then we kind of so if you can think of any right now, go ahead and type them in. Um, also, we're gonna be sending out the recording and, and a link to, to download the report later, and you can actually uh, send me uh, ideas as well. And we, will, we go through these and then we decide, first of all, what's gonna help the majority of the people in the field? Is it something that's in line with what we're asking in our survey in the first place? Like, it, we're not, trying to test effectiveness, so we wouldn't ask about that. But um, there's, you know, we just kind of want to see what's doable and what people want to know, because we want this report to have as much value as possible for you, so that you can advocate inside your organization and also outside of it. So um, Barbara has a great one here. She says, perhaps have a question on what recruiting methods are most effective. That one, oh. perha perhaps we could do that. Um, that actually has a sort of an end result, right? Trina, what do you think about that as an evaluator? Yeah, I do like that question because that's something that can actually be helpful to make decisions with, which is what we're really focused on from an evaluation perspective. You know, what can data tell us that can help us change the way we're doing things? Yeah. So if you're able to get some information about what have been successful types of recruitment techniques from the field, then yeah. those might be um, particular techniques where you'd like to focus your time. Yeah, yeah. Lisa asks, what kind of software do you use and do you like it? I, we had some uh, of our volunteer management software friends ask us to ask this question. And I said, well, we're not going to put it in this year, but maybe next year. So yeah, that would be interesting to ask. What types of software do you use? Maybe specifically on volunteer management software. If we ask just software in general, we'd probably get it too long of a list. but 
Um, Caitlin also asks, what system do you use to track your volunteer program? So uh, that's similar to this, what software do you use? Right. Um, so yeah, any other questions you think we should answer? Uh, things you'd like to know from your peers or things you'd like to have information to back you up when you're trying to make a pitch to management for more resources. Uh, there's lots of information in the uh, report around budgets too. There's program budget and there's um, organization mm -hmm. budget. And we do a little bit of cross tabbing and so we compare categories between, so you can see a little bit of that as well. Um, Brandon says, beyond recruitment, I think it, I would like to see the trends of effective engagement. Yeah, that it's tough for that one, Brandon, because everybody's with a, what their criteria for what they think is effective is different. So we'd have to think that one through. I'm not sure we we could do that. What, what do you think on that one, Trina? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple different possible angles for that. One is to identify what have been um, techniques for engagement that have been shown as positive or successful through other studies or research and use those as a foundation for the question, mm -hmm. or to actually do um, possibly maybe an open-ended question to ask people about the types of uh, positive engagement techniques that they have utilized and so we can come up with a definition for what positive engagement looks like. Yeah, I think we would have to, because for some people, when they think of effective engagement, they may think about volunteer recruitment. For other people, right. it may be that volunteers are uh, working together as a team really well, or that they have high retention rates. So we'd have to really, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I, can I ask Brandon if he's still there, what, what his reference point was for that when he asked the question. Fabulous. So he Brandon, no type that in. Tell, give us a little bit more context for your, your question. Yeah. He said, ideally retention, he says. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. That helps. Okay. So, uh, yeah. and then Barbara says, what percentage of volunteer managers do background checks? We did ask that last year. Uh, uh, we asked what types of uh, types of background check. Uh, so we got drilled down even a little bit deeper. Uh, I can't remember what the total percentage was, though. Do you remember, Trina? I cannot. Remember I don't remember, but it was it was pretty high, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. But I don't. Now we don't we had people like you. They could do their uh, you know resume. What did they do? Interviews, resume, um, uh, criminal background check, state, local, national. Right. Um, and then people had all kinds of other things they added that we hadn't thought of, like TB tests and, you know, all kinds of things that we didn't include in our categories. So, um, right. Lisa's, and it was related to, um, that was related to the type of cause in some instances, yeah. if it was a, uh, a medical versus, a child-based, um, service and, and so forth. So there was right. some variation with the type of cause. Now, this is a good way to go about this. Lisa says, I'd like to know what are average retention rates. I know what mine are, but whether or not they're, they're good or not. This is a great benchmarking question. So we would have to specifically, um, we'd have to define what we mean by retention uh, so that people could give us an accurate number and we're comparing apples to apples. But what do you think, Trina? I think that's a pretty pretty good one for people to benchmark on. Yeah, right? I think that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. I'd be really curious to know from the folks who are listening, how many of them actually calculate a retention rate? Yeah. If that's something that folks would have at their fingertips. So it may be, we may add to that question, don't know, right? I right. don't know, right? right? So I always think of retention in two ways. One is annual retention for your longer term volunteers or six month right. retention. Uh, you can decide for yourself depending on your program. But I also think about the retention in project based volunteers that they sign up for, you know, a six week project or six month project and they complete it. But if you're only counting retention as annual retention, that would, you know, work against you. So we might have to, right. we would have to really like be clear about, you know, what goes into the calculation, but I think that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, anybody like else have any? Sorry, Trina. 
No, that's okay. Uh, so it doesn't look like anything else is coming in, but keep typing if you got something. Uh, any questions or comments, go ahead and type them in. We still have a few minutes left. Uh, we'd be happy to answer anything about the survey itself, uh, any, you know, uh, any other questions you might have. And then while we're doing that, I want to uh, mention a couple of things. So we have, and um, Basil, can you um, put these links in, this link and the link on the next slide in the chat so people can click on it if they want and check it out. Uh, we're also going to send out an email, or Basil's going to, with a link to get the report. And we have the report on our website, on the Volunteer Pro website, and you can opt in to get it. Uh, and it's it's a big one. It's, it's beefy, about 46 pages. So also, while you're at that page, if you would do me a favor and just share it, like it, tweet it, share it in, 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 design, or in uh, LinkedIn, just so we can spread the word about that this report is here and ready for people to uh, download. It is, I think, over time, this is going to start to show trends and we're going to really start to be able to beef up the knowledge around the field of volunteer management. We are a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche and we have to start advocating for ourselves. And the first step towards advocating for ourselves is understanding and having hard data about who we are and what we do. And so this is our contribution to this uh, effort. Uh, looks like we have a couple of questions. Barbara also says, would like to know what recruitment strategies or outreach others have found effective. So there's a couple of things about what's effective. So we'd have to really think that through, Trina. Do folks want to know what yeah. methods, whether it's retention methods or recruitment or outreach methods, what methods are working best for people? Uh, and then Lisa right. says, what niche are we in human resources and what constitutes success those are big questions ah, those are huge nice questions <laughs> what constitutes success lisa's a deep thinker i can tell lisa is what? a deep thinker yeah and then i would say do we mean success on the part of the client experience or the volunteer experience right or the organization's outcomes or the organization, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That could be all over the place. So we'd have yeah. to drill down there. Yeah, fascinating, you guys. And Basil, if you would, um, I don't think I can download these, but download these chat questions and I'll put them in the file. So next year when we're going through all questions and we're figuring out which ones we're going to switch out, we will absolutely look through these. You guys have been so thoughtful in sharing those. Um, and if you have any questions, keep chatting them in. Um, and then the last thing, um, and then I think we have one more slide and Basil can um, log us out, but Trina has a great free resource that I just want to plug on her behalf. So if you're interested, oh. uh, <laughs> Trina, I'm sorry, but I have Thank to plug you. Trina because Trina uh, spent so much time uh, crunching our numbers when we put this report together. Pam and Trina and I were like in our pajamas in different <laughs> places all around the world. Uh, you know, around Christmas time, working night and day to get all this data crunched. And none of us get any money for this. We don't get a grant. We Nobody right. pays us. So we do it out of the love of the field and um, what we want to contribute to it. So if you're interested, she's got a great report. You can opt in if you go to our website and get this report on how to get, compete for funding and win. So um, uh, Trina's free resource um, and, my, and the volunteer management progress report links are both in the chat. Uh, but we'll also put these in the email when we send them out. So please share. Um, and I think if there's any other questions, I don't see any other questions. Uh, anything else you want to add, Trina? Um, no, just thank you all for your time and your attention today. And thanks for some really great questions. That's um, tremendous feedback that we can use as we continue to to pursue this survey in future years. So I think there were some great ideas there for, for new questions that'll be really helpful to the field. So thanks yeah. for that. Yeah, thank you so much everybody for joining us today. And Basil, do you have anything else you wanna say as we log out? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say thank you to you both for taking the time to present. Um, I don't think there could have been a better time to share this report. 
Um, it's such an important topic that's relevant to volunteer managers everywhere. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about how these trends develop uh, in the coming report. Um, and then uh, let's go ahead and close this webinar out. If your question didn't get answered, please forward them along to either Toby or Trina. Their contact information is provided in the follow-up email, which you'll receive approximately one hour after the webinar is over. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel later. So if you'd like to revisit parts of the webinar, you may do so there. Um, thanks again, Toby and Trina, and thank you to all of our listeners for attending. We hope to see you all on a future Volunteer Match webinar.